Good afternoon. The next item of business is a statement by Fiona Hislop on implications of the White Paper on Immigration and the Population of Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call on Fiona Hislop to make the statement. Cabinet Secretary, please. Uh, in the last week before Christmas, the UK Government published long-delayed plans for the immigration system after the UK leaves the EU. I want to provide Parliament with an assessment of the impact we think that these retrograde proposals will have on Scotland, building on the reaction the First Minister outlined in Downing Street. Making the positive case in support of immigration is sometimes a difficult thing for politicians to do. It is undoubtedly true that concerns about immigration were an important driver of the vote to leave the EU in some parts of the UK, and immigration remains a contentious issue for many. People with concerns deserve to be listened to and for them to be treated seriously. It is also true that these concerns are often based on misconceptions, not supported by evidence. Political leaders have a responsibility to listen, but also to respond in a way that builds understanding and raises awareness. It is greatly to the credit of this parliament that members here have risen to that challenge. We are all agreed that migration to Scotland supports economic growth, helps address the serious issue of long-term demographic change and enhances and sustains our communities. The Migration Advisory Committee undertook a review last year of the impact of migration on the UK labour market. They found no evidence that migration reduces employment or training opportunities or the wages of UK workers. Furthermore, there is clear evidence that migrants contribute more through taxes than they receive in benefits or public services. Migration, the committee finds, increases productivity, innovation and GDP per capita, helping raise living standards for all of us. It is therefore extremely disappointing that the policy measures the UK government has put forward fail to lead the debate or respond to the evidence. The proposals in the UK White Paper would prove economically damaging to the whole of the UK, but especially for Scotland. Presiding officer, I will briefly remind members of the key measures in the White Paper before describing why Scotland would fare worse than other parts of the UK. The UK Government plans to end freedom of movement of people from the EEA after the implementation period and manage all economic migration to the UK through a single system. That will, in effect, be the current Tier 2 employer-sponsored route for most workers with some adjustments. Tier 2 is widely held by business to be both complex and costly and is currently limited to only high-paid uh, graduate-level roles in the main. The UK proposes to lower the skill requirement once European migration comes into Tier 2 so that skilled roles below graduate level are eligible. However, they also intend to maintain a salary threshold expected to be set at £30,000. And that would price out many roles, even with a skill barrier reduced, and does nothing to address the fact that the administrative and financial cost of Tier 2 uh, means many small and medium in enterprises uh, cannot make use of it. The Federation of Small Businesses estimate that 95% of small businesses in the UK have never used Tier 2 due to these barriers. Cutting off access to international talent by ending free movement would be a disaster for these firms. There is also to be no route for what the UK government term lower skilled roles. Roles and important skills that actually make a vital contribution to our economy and society, such as social care, tourism, hospitality, construction and others. The 12 month visa for these workers announced as a transitional measure is inadequate for business and without a route to settlement would stop people with the important, valued and valuable skills we need from being able to live, work and importantly raise their family here and to help tackle demographic challenges. Remember that currently all our projected population growth is due to come from migration over the next 25 years. And these proposals will have a negative impact on the economy of the whole of the UK and the figures in the immigration white paper show this clearly. It is important that members are clear and understand that the impact of these changes would be greater in Scotland than the UK as a whole. UK government figures published in the white paper show that 80% of projected long-term EA worker inflows to the UK would be affected by these changes, rising to 85% for Scotland. This accords with the Scottish government's economic modelling published in our discussion paper, Scotland's Population Needs a Migration Policy, uh, published in earlier last year. 
Using official population projections from the ONS and the NRS, this showed that the slowdown in migration as a result of the Brexit vote would result in reduced GDP growth in the UK of 3.7% by 2040 and by 4.5% in Scotland. An alternative scenario using the 50% less EU migration projection estimated a 6.2% reduction in GDP growth for Scotland relative to growth in the economy under pre-Brexit population projections. And this scenario also estimates that the UK economy would be 5.9% smaller as a result of lower population growth. Separate modelling has also highlighted the importance of migration and of productivity. Under a hard Brexit, trade and tariff barriers are estimated to have the most immediate economic impact. But in the medium to long term, the impact of reduced migration and the decline in productivity will overtake that, accounting for up to 85% of lost economic growth compared to remaining in the EU. So migration is particularly important in supporting growth in our working age population. In the 50% reduction scenario, Scotland's working age population will decrease over the 25 years to 2041. But it's not 50% that the UK says migration to Scotland will fall by. It is 85% of future workers who would not be eligible under these plans. So it's never been clearer that keeping free movement of people would be both in Scotland and the UK's best interests. Free movement is also a set of reciprocal rights that British people as EU citizens themselves can also enjoy to live, work and study across the continent. We want our fellow EU citizens already in Scotland to stay. They are part of the fabric of our country. In December, we announced that the Scottish Government will deliver an advice service for EU citizens in Scotland in partnership with Citizens Advice Scotland and their network of Citizens Advice Bureau. There is an uh, urgent need for clear and trusted information on citizens' rights and the existing network of Citizens Advice Scotland, together with their trusted status, will allow the service to be delivered quickly across Scotland. Of course, the Scottish Parliament voted on the 19th of December, calling on the UK to scrap the settled status fee. But it does go, if it does go ahead, the, UK, the Scottish Government has made the commitment to pay the fees for EU citizens working in our devolved public services. This includes doctors, nurses and other public sector workers on whom we all rely. We'll be providing further details of the process for this shortly. As the disastrous approach of the UK government unfolds, there is growing support for a new tailor-made solution for Scotland. In response to the White Paper, the STUC said, the First Minister is right to highlight both the negative effect of pandering to an anti-migrant sentiment and the need for a separate Scottish approach. The STUC supports additional powers on migration for the Scottish Parliament. Business groups and employers have made similar statements. FSB Scotland said, we have argued that there should be a system in Scotland which responds to the particular needs of Scottish industry and demography. The Scottish Council for Development and Industry point out that uh, other countries successfully operate regional migration schemes which target the specific needs of their economies. There are workable options for more differentiation in the UK system. I would strongly encourage business to make their voice heard by responding to the white paper. It is important the UK government understands what business across the UK needs and what opportunities employers in Scotland see in a tailored approach to our uh, requirements. The Minister, Ben McPherson, uh, last year commissioned an independent expert advisory group to review the policy options before the UK government and consider the impact of those choices on areas of devolved responsibility in Scotland. They will provide their initial report next month and the Minister will return to Parliament with their findings. Presiding Officer, the White Paper is described as the UK's future skills-based immigration system. But as the Immigration Law Practitioners Association point out, it has very little to do with skills, or even more importantly, little to do with social values. Instead, it envisages a narrow, selective system based on wealth and the ability to pay, and focused on cutting numbers at the expense of all else. Presiding Officer, Scotland uh, has a different experience, and we want to form, uh, forge a, a different society where the contribution of the nurse, the carer, the restaurant worker, the technician are all seen and valued as core to our society and economy. Presiding officer, the UK immigration white paper is wrong-headed, but it is also wrong-hearted. Thank you very much.
The Cabinet Secretary will, the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow about 20 minutes for those questions, after which, as you know, we must move on to the next item of business. So if those members wish to ask questions, could you press the request to speak buttons now? I call firstly Adam Tompkins. Mr Tompkins, please. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of her statement. And there are some remarks in it with which I agree. I agree that, by and large, this Parliament uh, debates matters re relating to migration uh, to this Parliament's credit, and I hope that is continued this afternoon. And I also agree with her um, urging um, Scottish business and other um, uh, members of, important members of Scottish society to uh, take part in this consultation exercise. It's important to underscore that the white paper that was published last month is a consultation document, and all of us should feel free uh, to uh, um, engage in that consultation process and to encourage others uh, to do so. It's very important that the voice of Scottish business is fully uh, heard in this process. I, I want, if I may, presenting officer, to ask two questions uh, to the Cabinet Secretary relating to her statement. In her Florence speech of September 2017, the Prime Minister said this, I want to repeat to all EU citizens who have made their lives in our country, we want you to stay, we value you, and we thank you for your contribution to our national life. And the withdrawal agreement that has now been successfully negotiated by the Prime Minister and her team uh, with the European Union provides Exactly that, that all EU citizens lawfully residing in the United Kingdom at the end of the implementation period will be able to stay here in the United Kingdom. And it also makes extensive, detailed and welcome provision for family members, for children and for dependents. Um, the uh, Cabinet Secretary referred in, in her statement to, to a hard Brexit. The way to avoid a hard Brexit is to vote for the Prime Minister's deal, which delivers exactly what the SNP have been calling for. I asked Ben McPherson in December why his party colleagues in Westminster are preparing to vote against the deal rather than back it. He couldn't answer that question. I repeat the question today to the Cabinet, to the Cabinet Secretary. Why are the SNP not going to back this deal when it delivers exactly what the SNP have been calling for? The second question I wish to ask um, is this. Both immigration experts and business groups have previously condemned the SNP's insistence that powers over migration be devolved to this Parliament, including the Director of CBI Scotland, Food and Drink Federation Scotland, Scottish Chambers of Commerce and NFU Scotland. So given that the Minister did not repeat her party's call for immigration powers to be devolved, does that mean that the SNP have finally listened to the experts and dropped this unwanted and dangerous policy? For if so, that would be welcome. Cabinet Secretary. A number of issues. Can I make it clear that the problem with the Theresa May, May's uh, proposal and her deal is when it comes to aspects of freedom of movement, it would be as bad as no deal on the basis is ending freedom of movement. The majority of what I have laid out in my statement is the economic analysis about the freedom, um, freedom of movement being reduced. And under the white paper before us, which we are discussing, 85%, 85% of the, those uh, EU citizens that have been able to come here uh, previously would not be able to come. That affects our health service. That uh, affects so many parts of our businesses. It would be an economic disaster. So in those simple terms, there are many, many other things that are wrong with uh, Theresa May's deal. Uh, but in this one specific area, which we are addressing here in this chamber, that alone shows you how bad Theresa May's deal is. Freedom of movement is vital to this country. And in some of the other areas in relation to our proposals, we set out a very comprehensive paper. I published it in February last year, setting out what Scotland's proposals could be in relation to making sure we had a tailor-made system. Yes, would we want more powers to this parliament? Yes, we would. But we also want the powers to make sure we can make policy. And even policy within the UK system would allow us to address some of the issues that we have. When you have differentials uh, between salary levels, the median uh, salary level uh, in London is 32,000. Uh, in, in, the, in, in the society, it's 23,833 in Scotland. These are absolutely material uh, measures that, make a, that make, will make a difference in terms of how the white paper would be implemented. It is why he's right. We need to make sure people respond. But in terms of what the CBI Scotland have said, 
The proposals outlined in the White Paper don't meet Scotland's needs or the needs of the UK as a whole and would be a sucker punch for many firms right across the country. And the UK cannot indulge in selective hearing. It, turn, it tunes into business evidence on a disastrous Brexit no deal, but tunes out from the economic damage of draconian blocks on access to vital overseas workers. We in this uh, government have tried to compromise in so many different ways over the last few months in relation to Brexit, but surely to goodness. And this one practical measure, this one practical means by which businesses across uh, Scotland are starting to understand that actually a differential tailored solution and policy within the UK system could help our economy. Surely to goodness, this chamber, this parliament with the Conservatives could forge some kind of progress to make sure we protect, protect jobs, our health service and our economy. Uh, thank you. For our call, Claire Baker, can I say and understand why, but that was a five minute exchange. I've, I've got 12 people, including Ms Baker, wanting to ask questions. So please, can we have crisp questions and short answers as well, if appropriate? Not for you. You've got a time slot. Ms Baker, you have one minute to ask your question. Um, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary to advance copy of her statement. Um, if we are exiting the EU under the proposed deal or the disastrous no deal, we will see the end of freedom of movement. So how do we then retain the benefits that freedom of movement has given to Scotland? Our demographic challenges demand that we do. The White Paper fails to address Scotland's needs. It will restrict population growth. The proposed 30,000 threshold is unworkable. The 12 month visa is derisory and undervalues people. And the commitment to immigration targets from the Prime Minister does not respond to the needs of key sectors in Scotland. Perhaps not surprising given her approach when she was Home Secretary. We need flexibility within a UK framework. Other countries such as Canada and Australia have differentiation models that work. I fully appreciate how obdurate the UK government is on this issue, but can I ask what work the Scottish government has already undertaken to consider other models? And will the cabinet secretary commit to working with all parties to propose workable solutions that we can unite around? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I thank uh, Claire Baker for her question and the tone of her question. I think she's absolutely correct in identifying that actually no deal or Theresa May's deal would both remove freedom of movement, and that's the, the critical point. I think the uh, other aspect that she, she touched on and what can we try and do to address this, I think the issue about population is as critical as it is of migration. So even the, the white paper itself is saying, well, a 12 month, there might be a 12 month visa for some skill base. That doesn't encourage people to settle, to stay, to have families, uh, particularly in some of our uh, rural remote areas, a third of uh, local authorities are going to see population uh, decrease. So it's really important in terms of depopulation to address that. Um, her point about Parliament coming together, we have come together in many different ways. I would also point out that um, in terms of the, 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 the previous administration, um, in terms of uh, looking at students, for example, and some of the kind of uh, the, the Fresh Talent Initiative, that was another example where you could have a differentiated position within the UK system, perfectly possible. It's perfectly possible within this system, and I, she asked about what comparisons we've, we've made. If you look at the February paper that we produced from last year, we set out other countries and what they've done and what that can mean. This is doable and it's practical. There is so many things, so many things that are wrong with the UK system as a whole, its hostile environment and all the rest of it. But in terms of practical issues, what we can do together, and I sincerely hope the Conservative Party in Scotland could come with us on this, is to work with business, work with the voluntary sector, work with our local authorities and our health service to make sure that we absolutely can maintain the workers that we have and retain them, but also recruit new workers as well. Jerry Gilruth, followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that under the UK Government's pay-to-stay policy, EU nationals must apply to remain here, facing charges of £65 per adult and £32.50 per child, and if an organisation wishes to pay this fee on, the pa on behalf of their employees, they face a possible tax burden as a deemed taxable benefit, uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that if organisations wish to pay the Tories' shameful status fee, they, for their employees, they should be able to do so in a straightforward manner without additional charges. Cabinet Secretary. The uh, government is proposing that uh, workers are having to pay to stay with the rights by which they came and arrived here in the first place. And she's right to identify one of the problems in the imposition of the fee. If there is to be a fee, we've said that the Scottish Government will pay for those uh, devolved workers uh, under our uh, administrative uh, responsibilities. But other employers want to pay that fee as well if it is imposed. We should scrap the fee. We shouldn't have that in the first place. But if it is going to happen, 
uh, organisations like Heathrow Airport, Oxford University, a number of NHS boards, Colucci's restaurants chain, for example, have already said they'd want to pay. But they're going to be charged, it's going to be charged as a benefit in kind to, for their employ employees. And there isn't even the op op option to, to try and bulk pay it. So, you know, it's, it's retrograde in the first place, but even the incompetence of their application is causing difficulties. But I agree with the member in that regard. Jamie Green, followed by Bruce Crawford. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the Migration Advisory Committee's report and the benefits of migration it had, but it also said that a separate immigration system for Scotland was, and I quote, not justified. They're not the only people to think that. Many business organisations think the same. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, why are they all so wrong on this issue? Why shouldn't we be working to get a system that works for every constituent part of the UK? Why won't you work with us on that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one, I should suggest that uh, he reads the report properly. Um, he should also listen to the businesses like the Scottish Council of Development and Industry in terms of their comments about it. We can and should be looking at uh, other options if, and other countries do have differentiated systems. And in relation to, we're not saying, I am not arguing at this point for a completely separate Scottish immigration system. I am arguing and have consistently argued over a considerable period of time, had he bothered to read the February paper we put forward, a proposal that would allow us to have policy decisions that are tailor-made for Scotland, that would make sure that we have uh, and address the needs of our country, that we would take back control of our future in relation to the population needs of this country, for the employment needs for our industries, but also for the social and care needs of our health service, vitally important it is. So I would, I would please ask the, the, the Conservative Party to engage in two ways, to read the materials in front of them, but to also engage pro, uh, constructively, as I think our businesses in Scotland would wish them to do. Bruce Crawford, followed by Polly McNeill. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware of the award-winning Real Food Cafe in Tyndrum, which is a fantastic example of a successful tourism-related business in my constituency? Around 70% of the employees are from the EU. Many have stayed long-term and contribute hugely to the local economy. For example, one such employee is a retained fire worker. Does the Minister share the deep concern of the tourism and hospitality sector in Scotland, that the Tory post-Brexit migration policy could do serious harm to Scotland's rural economy. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I do indeed. And as the Tourism Secretary in the Scottish Government, I'm acutely aware of the concerns of the tourism sector. And he makes a very important point that it's about families settling and staying that is absolutely vital. Uh, but also, I think it's uh, really important to, to recall that the Migration Advisory Committee Chair, convener, when he came to this Parliament, uh, implied that it was something uh, unproductive about tourism in Scotland. It's a vital part of the economy. It's essential um, that it's addressed. And I was very pleased that the UK Tourism Minister, when I met him, agreed to engage with the chair of the Migration Advisory Committee uh, to dispossess him of some of the views that he obviously expressed to this Parliament's committee in relation to tourism. I have uh, seven minutes and eight people want to ask questions, so I want short questions. Polly McNeill, followed by Ross Greer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that there's a world of a difference between devolving immigration and a differentiated system of immigration, and the two should not be confused? And that case in point is the 1,700 EU nationals demonstrating the need for Scotland uh, to deal with this ageing population. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what contingency plans are there to ensure that social care no, services No, no, and I mean, I, I, I love you dearly, Miss McNeill, but I was hoping you were setting a crisp example. And I'm going to be naughty now and hard on you, everybody. Cabinet Secretary, uh, my yes. health is suffering. I, I, I missed the end, end of that question, but she's absolutely right. We are trying to take a pragmatic approach. We're compromising on so much in trying to make sure that we put forward something that we can all come together on. There's a very immediate issue and that has to be addressed and making sure we have a tailor-made so, uh, solution, tailor-made policies uh, that can put forward a Scottish visa position for uh, both salaries, for skill bases uh, in, that, in, in that area would absolutely help our economy and is something that we want to do. And we've been arguing for some time and if only, if only the Conservative Party could start listening and paying attention as uh, Paul McNeill obviously has. Ross Gear followed by Willie Rennie. 
Thank you. The UK's, uh, UK's hostile environment system is regularly exploited by human traffickers whose victims are disproportionately women. Given that expanding this system to European nationals will result in an increased number of human trafficking victims across the UK and here in Scotland, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what consideration might have been given to the potential need to increase support services for victims of human trafficking? Thank you, Mr Gear. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think that's a, a very important point. There are, are great ramifications, not the most obvious ones in this, in this the economy and society in relation to, to uh, ensure we've got the right workforce, but it's how people can arrive here. So I will draw um, to the attention of the Justice Secretary and any update I can provide from the, the Justice Department, we will. Willie Rennie, followed by Joan McAlpine. Uh, the strawberries left rotten in the fields of Fife due to the wider economic impacts that will come uh, from this immigration will be symbolic of the, the problems that will come with the UK government policy. Does the Minister not think that the UK Government needs to be straight with the British people about those economic impacts? Thank you, Mr Rennie. Charming as ever. Yes, Cabinet <laughs> Secretary. Yeah, yeah, yes, I do. And even the provisions that they have this year for the whole of the UK would not be sufficient for the berry fields and the agricultural work in Angus to, to satisfy the workforce need there, let alone the whole of Scotland, let alone the whole of the UK. So he makes a very important point. And when we have politicians, politicians talking about eating cheese and onion crisps, I think that's a triviality which some people who have got serious responsibility on the Conservative benches need to face up to when we're facing some of the issues that Willie Rennie talks about. Joe McAlpine followed by Alexander Stewart. Thank you. Professor Manning, who has been mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, the Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, admitted to the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee of this Parliament that he had done no modelling on the demographic or fiscal impacts of his proposals on Scotland and had done no in-depth study of differentiated migration systems in other countries such as Canada. Do you, does, the, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that that invalidates um, the conclusions of the MAC which dismissed uh, dismissed uh, differentiated cabinet uh, secretary migration. well there are can I just say that there, are, there is important evidence which I quoted in my statement about some of the the labor force issues and the labor market issues in the migration advisory committee but she's right the fundamental flaw in the migration advisory committee's approach is it doesn't tackle demographics and it doesn't tackle the fiscal consequences of lack of productivity economic growth because of population issues it's why we want to make sure that uh, population is key to the analysis we bring forward it's not just about short-term gain that's why the 12 month um, a visa is, is unsatisfactory because we do need to have longer term settlement. So these are issues that we will draw again to the attention of the Migration Advisory Committee. But as I've just said, I've already done that with one of the, tu the tourism minister in the UK because they have to understand that uh, dealing with labour force uh, analysis only will not tackle the needs of Scotland. Alexander Stewart, Paul Annabel Ewing. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The statement indicates all our projected population growth is due to come from migration over the next 25 years. How does the Scottish Government think that making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom will achieve that ambition? Cabinet Secretary. But we're not the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. We have people who are paying less tax than the rest of the United Kingdom. But it's important we address things in the round. We have to be attractive. That's why we are encouraging people to live, to work and study and invest in Scotland. But we need families. We need families to locate. And we need to make sure that we're not just saying if you can only come to Scotland if you earn over £30,000. That is no way to bring in the bright technician, the bright researcher, all those that have got the opportunities to build the entrepreneurial Scotland that we need. It is a mindset issue. And I, I think the problem we have is we have a Conservative government that is ideologically bound on this issue and is not looking at the evidence and the economic evidence in particular. Annabel Ewing, followed by Alec Rowley. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the clear message coming from business organisations in Scotland that the UK Government white paper proposals would place businesses in severe jeopardy, is it not simply the case, Cabinet Secretary, that the Conservative Party is putting dogma before rationality and the interests of our country? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member puts her finger on it. Even with the, with the limited uh, progress provision of the Migration Advisory Committee in looking at population, because they're only looking at the labour market 
issues. Even the evidence there shows that UK as a whole would be worse off. And that's why it's essential that we pursue this on the evidence before us, and the evidence before us need, uh, needs, leads us to the position that we have to change. And we are in the lucky position that people want to live and work in Scotland. It's why we see a movement from England to Scotland, people wanting to come to, to live and work in Scotland. We want that to be extended further and to make sure that we continue that provision. But the rate, already the rate of numbers of EU citizens coming to Scotland has declined and declined significantly. And we're already seeing, we haven't even left the EU, and we're already seeing the consequences of a flawed system. And that's before this white paper is set before us. Ali Rowley, followed by Emma Harper, last question. Presiding officer, some of the key sectors that the Cabinet Secretary talked about are dominated often by low pay, low terms and conditions. Does she agree that where government can intervene, such as a two-tier level uh, terms and condition and pay in social care, we should do so, so that every job that people come to this country is a decent paid job with decent terms and conditions? Cabinet Secretary. I agree, and that's why I think, and particularly in the social care sector, the fact that uh, it was this government that helped extend the provision for care workers in particular to make sure um, that the, the, the real living wage was extended across that. But I think he's right in saying that we want to ensure that we drive wages up because everybody benefits from that. But we have to do it in a responsible and sustainable way, and we have to work with employers to do so. Currently, employers under this scheme are getting press pressured that they won't necessarily have the labour force they need. They'll have rising costs because there'll be less of... Um, um, uh, less uh, economic impact because of the, the white paper and indeed Brexit more generally, but also reduction in, in the economic uh, GDP to the levels I've talked about, £10 billion by 2040 means there's less money in the public purse uh, from taxation to pay for nursing, social care, etc. So it's the whole system that we have to look at. Briefly, Emma Harper. Does the Scottish Government foresee the proposed extension of the £30,000 minimum earnings rule on two, Tier 2 visas? What impact will it have on public services and key economic sectors, including the agriculture sector, particularly in the south west of Scotland, where we have 48% of Scotland's dairy farms, many of which are reliant no, that's on lovely. EU workers? That's, that, we've got the percentage. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Clearly, no area is untouched and no area of business is untouched. I think the impact um, on the rural areas in particular is going to be absolutely catastrophic unless it's addressed. I pointed out previously, um, there's a limited agricultural workers pilot taking place just now. Two and a half thousand workers for the whole of the UK would not even fill the vacancies in the whole of Angus. This is something that we have to make sure that the UK government uh, understands. But if they are thorough to, to thinking about this in ideological terms and not in evidence-based economic terms, they won't address this. Thank you. That uh, concludes questions. And what do you know? We managed to get all questions in. Thank you very much. And brief pause before we move on to the next item of business. <laughs>